Believe or not believe. Believe or not believe. Muhammad in the Bible. Pagan alcohol in the Bible. Pagan alcohol in the Bible. The pig and alcohol in the Bible. This article is written in response to a question received from a Catholic who is contemplating adopting Islam. Greetings, I am of Catholic upbringing and I have been reading about Islam for the last few months. Many aspects of Islam appeal to me, but what I do not understand is why there are so many restrictions and prohibitions. I like to have a glass of wine sometimes with my dinner, but your religion says no alcohol is allowed. I also like a couple of slices of bacon with my breakfast. When I do treat myself, the amounts are almost negligible. I see those pleasures as totally harmless. What worries me is that if I become a Muslim, I would have to deprive myself of such harmless pleasures and without knowing the wisdom behind doing so. Can you tell me why is it necessary to go through such self-deprivation in order to worship the Lord? To address this inquiry and present a complete reply, the answer is divided into three parts. First, unknown to many Christians, both alcohol and pig meat are prohibited in the Bible and not just in the Quran. Muslims are aware of the prohibition in their book and observe it strictly. However, most Christians are unaware of these prohibitions in their book. Instead, they accuse Islam and the Quran of being too strict. One prohibition of pig in the Bible. And the swine, because it divideth the hoof, yet cheweth not the cud, it is unclean unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. Deuteronomy 14 verse 8. The same command is repeated in Leviticus. And the swine, though he divide the hoof, and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch, they are unclean to you. Leviticus 11 verses 7 to 8. In Isaiah 65 verses 2 to 4 and 66 colon 17, God issues a stern warning against those who eat swine. 2. Prohibition of alcohol in the Bible. Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Proverbs 20 verse 1. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Proverbs 23 verses 30 and 31. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Nor for princes intoxicating drink. Lest they drink and forget the law. And pervert the justice of all the afflicted. Proverbs 31 verses 4 to 5. Some interpreters attempt to dismiss the law in Proverbs 31 verses 4 to 5 by claiming that these words apply only to kings and princes. However, the words, lest they drink and forget the law, are decisive. What is the law that the kings would be forgetting if they drink wine? It can only be a law prohibiting drinking wine. It follows that the words kings and princes in the above passage are used to denote the ones who keep the law of the land and who are upright and righteous. It is important to note that when it comes to God's prohibited items, God never prohibited food items for kings and princes and not for the public. God's prohibited food items are prohibited for all people without distinction. The outcome of the above biblical prohibitions is that it is incorrect to speak of these two prohibitions, pig and alcohol, as being prohibitions exclusive to the Quran. What this also means is that Christians do not have to convert to Islam to desist from consuming these items. If they choose to remain Christians, they should also desist from consuming alcohol and pig meat. That is, if they wish to follow their own book. Second. Some Christians, mostly the one who are unwilling to change their lifestyle, state that these prohibitions are indeed in the Bible, however, they are in the Old Testament, Torah. They add that they are not bound by the law of the Old Testament because they follow the teachings of Jesus Christ only, New Testament. It can be shown that these words are quite uninformed. 1. Jesus Christ lived all his life as a Jew and according to the law of the Torah. In his own words, he proclaimed that he was not sent to change any letter of the law of the Torah but to confirm it. The following are the words of Jesus. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Matthew 5 17. 3. Jesus also confirmed that no one should change even one letter from the law of the Torah. So long as the heaven and the earth endure, not a letter, not a stroke, shall disappear from the law, till all have fulfilled. If any man therefore sets aside even the least of the law's demands, and teaches others to do the same, he will have the lowest place in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 18-19 The sincere followers of Jesus are therefore those who live by the same law with which Jesus lived. 
They will also, as Jesus commanded, allow no one to change that law, not even one letter of it. Third. As for the following inquiry. Can you tell me why is it necessary to go through such self-deprivation in order to worship the Lord? 1. The suggestion of deprivation is quite far from the truth. When we consider the infinite number of good food, drink and provisions granted to us by God, it becomes totally unjustified to suggest that abstaining from one or two items causes deprivation. 2. The bigger picture can be better comprehended when we inquire into the true meaning of worshipping God. Does worshipping God simply means the offering of prayers? The answer is that our daily prayers are only one among numerous acts of worship. As is shown on the page above, the act of worshipping God entails a number of acts and not just the act of prostration. An integral act that demonstrates our sincere worship of God is the act of obeying His law. Those who are sincere in their worship of God obey all of God's law willingly, while those who offer only lip service, they obey only those laws and rules that do not compromise their lifestyle. 3. It is also necessary to address the following inquiry from the question above. Why do I have to deprive myself of such harmless pleasures and without knowing the wisdom behind doing so? The simple answer is that by observing the law of God we demonstrate our submission to His will. Let us remind ourselves with the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible. God commanded the two of them to eat from all the fruit of paradise but not to go near one particular tree. Paradise was full of trees with all kinds of fruit. And so, abstaining from the forbidden tree would not have exactly been a case of deprivation. However, Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate from the forbidden tree. What is important here is that when the two of them ate from the forbidden tree neither of them died nor even had an upset stomach. The fruit of the forbidden tree was totally harmless. The harm they incurred was to themselves, for they had disobeyed God. The forbidden tree was no more than a test of obedience. Adam and Eve failed in that simple test of obedience. Equally, the so-called harmless glass of wine and a slice of bacon are simple tests of obedience. The human being cannot claim to worship God without demonstrating that he obeys God. To conclude, the Christians who accuse the Quran of being too strict in its prohibitions should know the facts, the same prohibitions are found in their own book. Equally, those who claim to follow Jesus Christ should also know the facts, Jesus Christ lived all his life as a Jew. He was sent to the children of Israel to call them back to the law which they had abandoned and badly corrupted. He lived all his life in total obedience to the law of God in the Torah. Jesus was also given a scripture from God, the Injil. This scripture confirmed the Torah, it did not violate it nor invalidate it. And we sent, following in their footsteps, Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming what came before him of the Torah. We gave him the Injil, containing guidance and light and confirming what came before it of the Torah, and providing guidance and advice for the reverend. 546 after the prophets of the Israelites, I sent Jesus, son of Mary, as a believer in the Torah, giving judgment in accordance with it. I also gave him the gospel that contained guidance to the truth and evidences to remove doubts and solve difficult cases of rulings. It corresponded to the Torah that came before it, except in a few rulings that it replaced. I made the gospel a guide and a means to restrain people from doing that which was prohibited. Almeida, 46. Believe or not believe. Muhammad in the Bible. For more than 14 centuries scholars from Judaism, Christianity and Islam have been discussing whether or not the Prophet Muhammad peace and mercy be upon him could have indeed been a true prophet from Almighty God. Was he the long-awaited Messiah the Jews have been waiting for so many centuries? Was he the one prophesied in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, calling in the wilderness? Was he that prophet mentioned in the New Testament Gospel of John? We would like to share some of the findings of these scholars from their own sources and invite the reader to consider these evidences. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14 verses 16 to 17 When the Advocate, Paraclete, is come whom I will send to you from the Father's presence, the Spirit of Truth who comes forth from the Father's presence, he will be a witness concerning me. John 15 verse 26 According to Muslim scholars, Muhammad, meaning the praised one, is almost the translation of the Greek word parakletos. In the Gospel of John 14 16, 15 26, and 16 colon 7. The word comforter is used in the English translation for the Greek word parakletos which means advocate or a kind friend rather than a comforter. Parakletos is the warped reading for parakletos. 
Some Christians say that the Comforter mentioned in these prophecies refers to the Holy Spirit. They fail to realize that the prophecy clearly says that only if Jesus departs will the Comforter come. The Bible states that the Holy Spirit was already present on earth before and during the time of Jesus, in the womb of Elizabeth, and again when Jesus was being baptized. Etc. Hence, this prophecy refers to none other than Muhammad. Islamic Research Foundation IRF.net, retrieved November 25, 2015 Speaks of God, God's help, coming from Tayman, an oasis north of Medina according to J. Hastings' Dictionary of the Bible, and the Holy One coming from Paran. Habakkuk 3 verse 3 That holy one who was under persecution migrated from Paran, Mecca, to be received enthusiastically in Medina was none but Prophet Muhammad. Indeed the incident of the migration of the Prophet and his persecuted followers is vividly described in Isaiah 21 verses 13 to 17. That section foretold as well about the Battle of Badr in which the few ill-armed faithful miraculously defeated the mighty men of Qadar, who sought to destroy Islam and intimidate their own folks. Who turned to Islam? Jabal al-Nur literally means, the Mount of Light, in Mecca. It was on this mountain that Muhammad received the first revelation of the Quran, which is verse 96, colon 1, read, In the name of your Lord who created, al-Maghribi, al-Samuel, Tawil, Abdul Wahab. Confuting the Jews, in Arabic, 1st 1989 edition. Syria, Dar al Kalam. P67. Another sign of the Prophet to come from Paran, Mecca, is that he will come with 10,000 of saints, Deuteronomy 33, verse 2 KJV. That was the number of faithful who accompanied Prophet Muhammad to Mecca in his victorious, bloodless return to his birthplace to destroy the remaining symbols of idolatry in the Kaaba. The text says, He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with 10,000 of saints, from his right hand went a fiery law for them. According to the Islamic history, the city of Mecca, Paran, was liberated by Prophet Muhammad's 10,000 troops. If Muhammad who liberated the city of Paran with 10,000 believing men, the saints, was not the one who fulfilled this biblical prophecy and ended the worship of the 365 gods in the form of idols. Then who is that prophet? Is there another prophet who marched upon Mecca with this exact same number of men? The historical answer is, Prophet Muhammad is the only prophet on whom this prophecy fits perfectly. Since it has clearly been shown that Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, is mentioned in the Bible as a next step. We invite you to look into Islam by reading a translation of the Quran and learning more about Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. Many people are attached to their identity and don't want to look into another religion. But Islam is not just another religion, it's the same core message of monotheism preached by Moses, Jesus and Abraham, peace be upon them. It is the final installment of the same message sent by God over the centuries.